welcome back everyone. Uh, we have a special treat today. I am here with the great Bob Williams. And um, you might not know who that is by name, but you'll definitely have heard him on record at some point. Um, Bob recently retired uh, from 47 years as principal bassoon of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And uh, he recently came back down here to Tucson, and I, uh, I begged him to come on camera and talk a little bit about some of the records he made over the course of his career with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. So, um, Bob, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, yourself, your career, your path as a musician? Yeah, so I, I grew up right here in Tucson. I was born literally about three miles from where we're sitting right now. So I went to, uh, I, I did local music program. I'm, my best friend was a very good clarinet player, and, and I was a second chair clarinet player. So I, in eighth grade, I switched to the bassoon and we kind of followed paths all the way through college. Uh, but I ended up, I, I was very lucky, I went to the University of Arizona, and my freshman year, uh, I ended up playing in the Tucson Symphony, playing, I think, contra bassoon and assistant principal, something like that. Uh, but at the beginning of my sophomore year, the bassoon teacher, who was going to be a TA uh, at the University of Arizona, got sick and couldn't teach, so all of a sudden the University of Arizona faculty wind quintet did not have a bassoon player, so I was kind of drafted into the faculty wind quintet my sophomore year. And halfway through my sophomore year, the principal bassoon of the Tucson Symphony, who was Gordon Soley, ended up with a sinus infection, and they ended at the time they had to pull all of his up, a lot of his upper teeth, which put him out of action, so all of a sudden I, I moved up to principal bassoon in the Tucson Symphony. That was like in 1969. So, and then I kept the job uh, the next two years, my uh, junior and senior year at the University of Arizona. Uh, I went to grad school one year at the University of Southern California, then got uh, the principal bassoon job in the Winnipeg Symphony, and I played in Winnipeg from 1972 to 1974. I won the audition for the principal job in the Detroit Symphony in 74 and played there until I retired during COVID basically in 2020. Wow. So, so in 74 I was hired, uh, the, the music director at the time was Aldo Chicado, and but he only stayed around for a couple more years and then the DSO hired uh, Antil Dorati as a music director and Gerardi really decided that if he was going to be hired, he wanted to make recordings, he wanted to do touring, uh, he also wanted to expand the size of the orchestra. I think with Gerardi there, the orchestra size expanded to about 102 people. So he really put a dent in the orchestra. Of course, he spent all this money doing these things and then the orchestra almost went bankrupt, so they, they <laughs> I think they probably fired him you know, five or six years after that, but we did a lot. We did our first recordings. We had a we had a five-week tour in 1979 oh, wow. that was just an extremely special, you know, it's one of the, my favorite memories of my entire life, especially we played a concert in Berlin. Uh, we were supposed to have, uh, our soloist was um, Yehudi Menuhin. Menuhin. Menuhin got sick, couldn't play the concert, so instead of playing a violin concerto the first half, first half I think we played the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, the second half we played Beethoven 7 and the audience there didn't stop applauding. I mean, I was, I was putting away my bassoon, everybody else had left and the audience was still applauding in the, uh, the Berlin Philharmonic, you know, the new auditorium there. So that was, that was quite a thing with Gerardi. But Gerardi did a lot of recordings and then uh, a few years after that we had a gentleman named Gunter Herbig who didn't make many, I think we might have made, made a couple of recordings with Herbig. But then, then we hired Naomi Yarby, and of course Yarby lived to record, and Yarby lived to record pieces that nobody else had recorded. So I think one of Yarby's specialty is to make bad music sound really, really good. Even though I think in many ways he could make really great music not sound so good, but I, I love Naomi Yarby. <laughs> and then when, when Naomi left, uh, we hired uh, Leonard Slatkin, and Slatkin basically at that time, after we had a big strike in 2010, and on the settlement of the strike, we basically said they could record anything and make CDs of any performances. So we would be making, uh, we would be basically recording uh, concerts, and then at the end of the playing the pieces, of, we would be recording maybe three times. We would have patch sessions in case there was audience noise or something like that. We recorded uh, one of the things that Slacken wanted to do was to record a lot of John Williams. 
concertos for solo instruments. Mm -hmm. So we recorded, uh, I know the horn concerto, but uh, cello concerto, that we recorded five or six of them, but one of the pieces we recorded was his Five Sacred Trees, which is a bassoon concerto. And we did that, and I was very happy with the recording. And that, once again, you know, we we recorded it three times, and I don't think I had to do much on the patch session except re-record the opening because of the crowd noise. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, you know, with, with Dorati, it was funny. Dorati, we actually made recordings we would take it was totally different from our, our uh, orchestra schedule, even though a lot of the times we'd, we'd be playing the pieces we were going to record the week before, and then we would actually have recording sessions. And we were playing most of our concerts with Dorati in an a, a auditorium called Ford Auditorium, which was on the river, which was basically a, a multi-use auditorium. It didn't have very good acoustics. It kind of reminded me of the Tucson Symphony Hall that they have here in Tucson. So they needed a place to find in Detroit that where the you know, acoustics would, would be inducive for making a better recording. And they found this old United Artists Theater that was um, vacant at the time. It used to be a movie theater, but nobody was in there, but they loved the acoustics. And, and so we would go to the United Art Artists uh, Theater and do recordings. Usually we do two recordings in a day. I think that there might be two or three hour sessions and when you're doing recordings, you get a fair amount of breaks. But it was it was really interesting because the, the United Artists Theater started off fairly clean, but the more we would go back year after year, and by the end we were there, they were bringing in heat. Water was dripping from the ceilings. If it was raining, you know, they'd have to... It was a total disaster. So the final, I think, recordings we made with Dorati, they actually made them back in Orchestra Hall where the orchestra ended up moving around the end of 1979. It was a wonderful hall that, that I ended my career in. Uh, we, we moved from Ford Auditorium when we saw a uh, article in the newspaper, one of the Detroit papers said that the mayor at the time, his name was Coleman Young, decided he wanted to make an uh, aquarium where Ford Auditorium was. So we decided that we saw the writing on the wall and, and it basically moved the orchestra back to its home of Orchestra Hall, which was probably one of the best things the Detroit Symphony ever did. It was a, it's a great hall, and it was recently remodeled too, right? It, it was remodeled, yeah, and and that was another. That was one of the reasons why we were on the strike because it cost a lot of money. They were trying to. They made enough money for the the remodel, but they ended up spending the money for something else, thinking they'd take a mortgage out to pay for the remodeling, and then they didn't have the money to pay off the mortgage. So the we were on strike from, uh, I think it was October of 2010 to April of 2011. We had a six-month strike that, uh, when we came back, uh, we lost a lot of, really, a lot of people retired and, and a lot of our musicians had, had left. So it was, a, it was kind of a downer for me, but uh, anyway, it's always been a great orchestra and, and the new hires that they hired after the strike have all been fantastic players. So the orchestra... I, I really think it's a it's a fantastic orchestra. Yeah, I know I know a few people that still play there. Yeah. Now I, I wanted to ask you because our listeners uh, might especially appreciate this. You came into the Detroit Symphony at a time when um, the classical recording industry was still a a big kind of behemoth, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, uh, as some of you may know, Detroit recorded primarily under Durati for London Decca. For right. Decca. Under Perret, they made all these beautiful yes. Mercury recordings. We all know the Perret Mercury recordings. And, and they well. were made, a lot of the, the, Mer the Perret recordings were made in, in an old high school auditorium, Cass, really? Cass High School, which was an extremely good high school for the arts. That's, a lot of the members of the orchestra went to Cass High School. It was a, oh. it was a and it's funny, that cast still exists, but they tore down the old building and made a new cast. Oh, no. Technical high, it was called Taft. But the orchestra made a lot of, of their recordings with Parade in yeah. Cast Tech. And I think they also might have done some at Orchestra Hall. But, uh, you know, Ford Auditorium, where I started my career, was not a very good hall. You know, it didn't. But the United Artists, you know, they had all this built-in reverb and the... You know, they'd bring in all the recording engineers, they had to bring in lights, they had to find places. Oh. And then as, it was funny when they started recording at Orchestra Hall, instead of recording on the stage, they got a platform in the middle of the audience where the orchestra would play, I think, just basically for the reverb. So it was, oh. it was more, they had to build a platform, and I think those might have been uh, Dorati's last recordings in Orchestra Hall after United Artists had deteriorated to such an extent that we couldn't use it anymore. 
So when you started recording with the orchestra, um, the recording process was probably very different, right? Right. I mean, when we recorded back then, we would do takes. You know, they would be doing it on, on tape, and they would be cutting, paste, and, you know, okay. And they were specific recording sessions, correct? Right. We, we, we were hired for recording sessions, and they, it paid really, really well. It, you know, one week, we had a recording, we would, like, double our salary. It was... Uh, it was uh, Quite different than what we ended up doing it towards the end, where we didn't make any money for recordings. So now, at that point, so this is the late seventies. Would you have specific rehearsals for recordings, or would it just be tacked on to the end of a uh, of a cycle? Most of the time, uh, what we would do is we would play what we were going to record in the previous week's concert, mm-hmm. and then they would set up recording sessions. They might be we might have finished the last concert on Saturday, so they might set the recordings for Sunday and Monday or something like that. Sunday, you know, it would be in addition to our, our normal orchestra work. So a significant amount of recording time. Yeah, it, it, and, and it was, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was a totally different than we ended up doing. I mean, with Dorati, I mean, it was, okay, we'll take A from here to here to here. Towards the end, you know, by the time with, with Slacken, we would just record concerts, and if somebody screwed something up, you know, they would try to fix that in a patch session. Yeah, so live, you know, live recordings are recorded during the concert, which is, it tends to be what, what happens now. That's, that, I think that's the bulk of the recordings. It's a much less expensive way to, to make records for, mm-hmm. uh, for orchestras and things like that. And I think most orchestras now have things in their contract where they, uh, they allow the orchestra to be recorded a certain amount of time. And, and, uh, and, I, and you know, Back in the good old days with Durati and, and even a little bit with Yarby when we first started off with Yarby, we had separate sessions for making recordings. In the, mm-hmm. in the episode. But uh, in these recording sessions in the beginning, um, I know you obviously you talked about patch sessions, but you probably had um, it was probably significantly big takes, largely big takes, right? Yeah, I think so. But but I mean, like, like Rite of Spring. I mean, we probably recorded the opening of the Rite of Spring, you know, four or five times, which uh-huh. was nice because that was my. Big solo. I remember that we recorded the Rite of Spring in, um, I think it was in early May of 1981. And the reason I can, I know that is that my wife played English horn in the orchestra, and she was nine months pregnant with her first son. So it, it was interesting. So we we recorded, we, we we played the Rite of Spring the previous week in concerts, and she they brought in an extra English horn player in case she went in labor. And they also had to bring in a extra bassoon player in case you know she was labor and I had to miss her, miss the recording. And they docked my pay, but they didn't dock hers. <laughs> but it turned out she she ended up our, our son was late, and she made the recording. I mean, she was nine months pregnant, and and yeah, you know, she's I don't know if you've ever heard any of her playing, but she's a phenomenal. I've heard her on record. She's yeah. she's just a phenomenal player. I I think I think she puts. I think she's probably one of the greatest English horn players that ever played, and, and, I, and that's not, you know, a lot of people tell me that when they hear recordings and things like that. They, in fact, audiophiles out there, you may know his wife, Treva, from a very famous recording uh, they did in the 70s with uh, Dallas Symphony Orchestra, Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances. That right. is an yeah. audiophile favorite. It's been reissued a few <laughs> times. That's right. She was in Dallas before she came to Detroit. So, yeah, Treva started in Detroit in 75, and I started in 74. But when she started in Detroit, she had just come off of, I think, a year leave. The, the Dallas Symphony was out of work. They were on strike for a year. And then she came back, started in Detroit in 75. We worked for, I think, two weeks. And then we were on strike for uh-huh. nine weeks in Detroit. So she she had no money at all. I mean, it was it was a bad time for her. But she's she's a phenomenal musician. I mean, it was funny, especially with, with Yardy. Yardy used to pick pieces with big English horn solos. And, I remember we recorded the School of Scandal by Samuel Barber, and the, it's got the beautiful Lobo solo, and then the English horn plays a little bit later. I mean, you're an English horn player, so you, you, you know all this. So. I, I haven't played that piece yet, though. It's a, oh, it's a, it's a Barber's. We, yeah. we did a lot of Barber with, with Yarby, and we did a couple of symphonies, a lot of his. Uh, I mean, I just, his, his music is fantastic, of course. And, and then Slacken loved Barber, too. I mean, Slacken, you know, I, I think he's, he's, he's just a phenomenal. Just, just his music is just, just out of. Yeah, out I'm, of I'm a big fan as well. Yeah. In fact, I mean, not these weren't the Detroit Parade recordings, but a lot of my favorite records are the Mercury recordings they did of Samuel Barber's music with the Eastman Rochester Philharmonic. Mm-hmm. Um, those are really special recordings to me. Yeah. Slack and I know did a lot of beautiful recordings with St. Louis. Of the oh yeah, I'm, I'm Teller. Yeah, I have I mean, some. Th- of them. Those are, I mean, the, rec- the concertos that he did, and, and, and 
Slag, Slagan was interesting. I mean, he was uh, he wrote a book I, called. I, the, I played under him. Yeah, the business of conducting, and, and that that's Leonard Slagan. And he's, but I, I have to say, I mean, when we recorded the Five Sacred Trees, which I was dreading, which, which is a bassoon concerto, he helped. He saved my ass many, many times in that recording. <laughs> so I, I I thank him for that. So thank you, Leonard. If you ever see this, Leonard, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Well, we, we have we you picked out some of your records that you played yeah. on to show us, but before <laughs> before I get to that, I wanted to ask you um, because you know I'm from a different generation and I discovered a lot of these older recordings later in my life. But a lot of these recordings, these big audio file recordings from the 50s and 60s, were around when you were growing up. Do you have any particular favorites, favorite re orchestral recordings that you remember? I, I remember hearing Bluebeard's Castle. And I can't remember who was... I mean, that was the piece that we played if we were trying out audio equipment. Blue oh. Beer's Castle. Because there was a couple spots in that. And But the, but the recording that everybody always loves is the, uh, the, the Shaw recording of the Bach cantatas with uh, oh. Mark Lipsky. Oh, yeah, Mark Lipsky. Lipsky. Yeah, yeah. Mark I, Lipsky I have a few copies of that. Yeah. And I know you did, too. Yeah, I had them up, I had them up there. I mean, that from, from a wind player's standpoint, those are just... Those are music from God, you know, with Lipschitz playing. It yeah, for those for those that don't know what we're talking about, this is the uh, RCA Living Stereo recording of Mark Lipschitz playing the Bach cantata "Ich habe You have it up there? Yeah, I have it up there. I'll, I'll show it to you. Why don't grab it? So we went and retrieved this for us. This is the uh, LSC twenty three twelve. Um, Mac Harrell and uh, Mark Lipschitz playing the Bach cantata "Ich habe Just one of the one of the. Not only is this a wonderful living stereo record from a sonic perspective, but it's some of the best oboe playing I've ever heard. Oh, yeah, and, and then Mac Harrell was dying at the time, too. I mean, I think he died a few months after that. Oh, wow. He was, and, and of course, Mac Harrell is, he's Lynn Harrell's father. Mm -hmm. and, and so he was, uh, and this was done, I think, with members of the Cleveland Orchestra. Yeah. But uh, there's some funny stories. I think, I think uh, Mark Lipschy was playing principal oboe, and Eldon Gatwood was playing second oboe. And, and supposedly there are a lot of places where Eldon would play the low notes, you know, -da -da -da. you know, you know, there'd be some kind of oboe solo where, 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 where Lifshi would go low and, and Gavin would sneak. This in. was in the Cleveland Orchestra. They, yeah, he was second oboe in the Cleveland Orchestra at the time. He ended up going I heard to about Pittsburgh. That. Yeah, he, he ended up going. Gavin ended up going to Pittsburgh. I think he was principal in Pittsburgh. Well, I heard that Zell would do funny things sometimes and kind of almost reorchestrate the parts because I, I remember someone telling me at one point that the Dvorak Seven recording, and I need to go back and listen to this to confirm it, but. I, someone mentioned that for Dvorak 7, he had the second oboe play English horn uh -huh. instead for that for that opening of the slow movement. Um, <laughs> so I, I've definitely heard some stories of Zell doing that to his Remember, one I, section. I, uh, Gatwood's niece played cello in the Detroit Symphony for a while, for a long time, actually. And, and I remember calling him and talking to him once, and I was talking to him about this recording because it was it's it's such a... A wonderful recording for uh, for for wind players. It's just a, it's just yeah. a sp spectacular recording. And this one is, guys, if you're out there, this one is pretty easy to find. It's not like some of the old Reiner ones that you're going to pay, uh, you know, more than a hundred dollars for. You can probably find this for twenty, thirty dollars, very clean, on the secondhand market. But let's talk about some of the records that you played. All right. Well, um, this this is the Prague waltzes and Czech suite. This was this was one of my first early, really, really beautiful. Recordings that we made with Dorati because I didn't know any of the music and, and they're just they're just it's just wonderful music the, Yeah, I don't think I've ever played that piece. The Czech suite is is uh, I know there's a there's a, a Version for eight winds that has been reorchestrated for eight winds I remember I was in Japan and I was a special guest artist for the Wago performing arts or really and I had to do a, a, a Chamber concert and we played that the Czech suite on that but but that, I mean, it was, it's, it's just a beautiful piece. I mean, that was the one, the, the one, let's see, there's a really funny one here. I, that, uh, uh, the, this Rhapsody yeah. one, this was one of the... This is an earlier one, because this is analog. This yeah, is this is an analog. And, and I remember we were, we were recording all of the, it's the Nesco Romanian Rhapsody. We, that was the last piece we played, and we were running out of recording time. And, and the opening has this big viola solo. <laughs> And we we ran through this. I think we might have re ended up recording this on one take. And at the end of the take, our our, our principal viola was Nate Gordon at the time. He was, Maestro, can we do this again? I screwed up something here. And 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 Durati went and said, Well, j just when you come around next time you play it, if you play it when that passage comes along, just cough during that passage. Because <laughs> we were out of time, but oh, it was no. a. 
But it had, you know, the Dvorak, the Rhapsody Espanol, of course, has a big bassoon solo, clarinet solos. But it was a, that was one of the early recordings we did, too. But, I, you know, talking about recording sessions, when we did the UNESCO, it was, we were running out of time. And, the, and literally, I think that the UNESCO is one take. So if you want to listen to that for the, the one take, this just, we did a lot of uh, Copeland with Dorati. And it's funny, a lot of the stuff we re-recorded with, with Slatkin later on, you know, in the last 10 years. And I, the, one, the one piece on this one that I, I really think is a great piece, but nobody knows it much, is a, the dance symphony. And that was... Yeah, I don't think I've ever listened to that. And there was, and, and it was taken from, a, I think it was an opera piece that he wrote, and I can't even think of the name of it now, but we recorded the original with Slatkin. But it's basically, it's a dance symphony in slightly different, different vein. But it's got a lot of nice bassoon solos. I mean, that, that's why I kind of pull that one out. It's, oh, yeah. And great, great, win, just woodwind writing. Well, in general, El, El Salon, nice. Mexico. I remember, I remember, I, I went to the, you know, we recorded El Salon, Mexico with Dorati, and then I, I went to uh, Sub in Boston, and and the Boston Symphony hadn't played it in quite a while, and, and, and I think it was Ozawa was conducting, and, and they, Boston had a lot more trouble playing it than we did, just, just from It's the, not as that, easy as it seems. No, it's, it's a touchy yeah, piece. We did it, yeah, we did it at Aspen with uh, Ludovic Merol. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was more demanding than I thought it was going to be. So th this, is, this is an interesting recording. It's, it's uh, I have the this DeRozan Cavalier Suite, and, and it was Dorati's Suite from the DeRozan Cavalier. And, and the funny thing is that we wanted to play it back in Detroit... I think it was about, you know, this was, these, all, all these recordings were done probably 30, 35 years ago. So we were going to do the Rosen Gabler Suite again maybe six or seven years ago, and they wanted to use the Durati version, and they can't find it. Oh, no. Nobody could find the Durati version of what we recorded on, on this particular uh, LP. So it was, that was kind of an interesting thing. I, I think he recorded it once before, because I believe I have a recording of, it, of him doing it with Minneapolis. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, on yeah. Mercury. With the Rosen Cavalier Suite, because I remember getting it, and I had just played Rosen Cavalier Suite, yeah. and I got it. I was like, "Oh boy, Rosen Cavalier Suite!" And I'm listening to it. I'm like, "This is different." Yeah, I think I think this was the first recording we ever did in Detroit with Girardi. With it's got the 1812 overture, and I remember they they imported the chimes. I think from a, I don't know if it was a Washington National Cathedral or something like really? that. At the end, you know, they added they added chimes and things like that to the recording. Now, how did they do the canons on this one? Because I don't think I have this. You know, I can't did they do remember. cannons, or did they just do bass drum hits? I think they may have added the cannons later. I don't really know. To yeah. be honest. I should look at it. <laughs> but for, for audio files, that's a big contention, is, is how are they doing the cannons? Because yeah. we, it's funny, we, we, were, we were, I don't know if we were recording 1812, but this was when we moved into Orchestra Hall, and they wanted to test fire what, what it would be like to shoot off cannons outside of Orchestra Hall, and they had these cannons outside the hall and they shot him off and all this dirt and dust came oh, from down the <laughs> from the hall that had been sitting up in the rafters for the last, you know, Orchestra Hall is an old hall. It's probably yeah. it was 80 years old at the time. I, I remember back in the, back in the, six, <laughs> back in the 60s, not that I remember the 60s, but um, uh, when the, I think the, one of the first big stereo 1812s to come out was Reiner's version with Chicago and yeah. they didn't use cannons. They released that and then a month later Mercury released theirs with cannons, in with it. cannons. And, they, <laughs> and poor RCA had to delete the Reiner 1812 from the catalog because they couldn't sell it now that they didn't have cannons. They didn't have cannons. Well, th this this of course is is, is one of my every, uh, every bassoon player's favorite. Yeah, th this 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 was. I, I know the date of this recording. It was May of 1981. The reason I know that is because our our first son was born on May 22nd of 1981, and my wife Treva Womble was playing English horn. On this, and of course, she uh, they had to, to hire a spare English horn player in case she went into labor. They also had to hire a spare bassoonist in case uh, I was at the labor. But she held off Seton. Our son's name was Seton, and he he was born. He came a little bit late, and we made the recording. And uh, so this has always been a special recording to all of us. I remember when he was a little boy. You know, he, we would play the recording. It seemed like he remembered it when he was in utero. You know, he could remember the Rite of Spring. So back when, so I want to talk about the Rite of Spring. Back when, back when you were coming up in the orchestral scene, was the Rite of Spring still considered hard? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Because it, it feels like now no one considers it hard. It's it's no, easy now. It's funny, you know, with Girardi. Girardi didn't have a really clear beat, mm -hmm. and and I've played it. You know, I probably played it under a dozen different conductors, and you know, some of them 
are just so clear. I mean, we had uh, Rafael Frugat de Burgos. We played that with him about, I think, about a year before he died, and it was crystal clear. And, then, and I think the last time I played it, it was with uh, who's, the, who's the conductor of the, of the Atlanta Symphony that Spano. Oh yeah, yeah. Spano conducted it with this, and, and it was absolutely. I mean, we, you could tell everything. Girardi just it was like going around in circles, and you, you know, <laughs> and you listen to the recording. and said, "How the hell did we ever stay together in that recording?" You know, and, and it's, and you know, you know, some conductors, you know, are, are crystal clear. Some you know, just you, you hope for the best, and you, you count and things like that. Yeah. But <laughs> that was. The, I, I played that piece a few times, but um, I remember in my undergrad at Manhattan School, um, we did a we did a winds and brass reading of it with with Mark Gould, the trumpet player, uh-huh. and um, for some reason he decided that in the first reading session that um, first the first bassoon player had to play the solo, and he wanted them to play it a half step up just once because he wanted it to be hard for them again. Like, it's, just, it's too easy now, and then he had the second bassoon player do it as well. Oh uh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a funny story about that because we always, when we play it, you know, it's always like we're trying to play it so beautiful and things like that. It's yeah. like, like, like I think Dorani said... It definitely it was, didn't sound beautiful in 1913. It was like, yeah, it was like, like the, 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 you know, the opening, like the, the bulbs, you know, blossoming in, at the beginning of, of spring. And, and, and I think that's not what Stravinsky had in mind. Yeah. He wanted something kind of crude and ugly. And primal. Primal, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that was his idea, but none of us play it that way. Not less, not less asked, but I mean, we, we always try to play it beautifully, you know, and stuff like that. Start off really piano small and hold the high C. And, yeah, but it's, it's always, I, I remember the first time I ever played it, I was a student at the Music Academy of the West, and we, we were, in one concert, we did all three of the, of the big, uh, uh, big Stravinsky pieces. We did the Rite of Spring, Firebird, and Petrushka. And, you know, I, so I, and they would switch the, uh, the, uh, People around for the parts, so I, I ended up. I remember I played the Rite of Spring because I was the supposedly the, the big bassoonist there at the time. So well, th- this is a question I have for you, and excluding your own recording, which I know you is a, has a special place in your heart. What's what are some of your favorite Rite of Spring recordings? I'm always curious to ask this question because it seems like this piece opinions divide a lot. Boy. <laughs> Did I put you on the spot? Yeah, I, 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 I've always loved Bernie Garfield. I actually, I, I, I didn't do this intentionally, but I, this is a, 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 a one of my former students, Juan de Gomar, gave me this T-shirt. I've never I put it on today when I came home. It was no, no, I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking of this uh, interview. But I mean, he was, he was always such a phenomenal bassoonist and, and beautiful because he was a bassoon beautiful player. And where, where did he play? He played Philadelphia. He was in Philadelphia for. So this, this would have been the Ormandy recording. Though. Yes, Ormery recording. Uh, I don't think I don't think Leonard Shero ever recorded Rite of Spring with Reiner. Never recorded Rite of Spring. I don't think. No, Reiner didn't. Yeah. So, because um, the, the Schulte has been my go-to for a long time. Yeah, Chicago Symphony. Yeah. yeah, it was probably. Yeah, they're all. You know, I mean, you listen to the recordings, and, and there's so many of them right now. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just. But now I find that a lot of them sound the same. Yeah, or, or the, a lot of the interpretations have kind of blended together, and the orchestra sound has kind of blended together a little bit more. But you look, yeah. go back and listen to some of these older ones. Every orchestra had its own sound. Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, when I went, when I was growing up in college, you know, you could almost pick out the orchestra from the wind playing, yeah. and, and you could pick out uh, you know Stell, and you could pick out. Uh, oh yeah, and jo- you know John Delancey and John Mack, both incredible musicians, studied yeah. with the same teacher, but had a completely different different yeah. conception of oboe one. So th- this recording, this was a recording that we did with Durati. In the United Artists Theory, uh, Theater in in Detroit with uh, the Egyptian Helena, and uh, Gwyneth Jones was the, the the head soprano, the main soprano, in the concert. So this was a this was an opera recording. So I think we probably had at least four recording sessions to record this. And this was in this auditorium that was dripping water at the time. And 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 I the the, the funniest thing I can remember is that at the beginning of the last session. We didn't quite start at the beginning. We didn't start on time. Gwyneth Jones was in complaining to the recording engineers that she wanted to have her plane fare back to London paid for, and supposedly it wasn't in her contract or something like that. So she was making this big stink, holding out this recording. That, you know, I mean, if you look at it, that Barbara Hendricks was on this recording. She ended up at being a, a very, very successful soprano singer. And, uh, you know, this was, I think she... Her her job or her, her 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 role in this one was the enchanted seashell or something like that, 
I still don't quite understand what this recording's all about. But it yeah, was, it, it, it's a Strauss opera that I'm, I don't yeah. recognize, yeah. and it's, it's a world <laughs> premiere recording. So that's the yeah. So this this was our recording with Dorati, but uh, you know we 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 made quite a few recordings with Dorati, and then Yarby. I think we made many many more, but those were all more uh, CDs. Yeah. I don't think we had any LPs with 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 Yarby. The 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 first the Rite of Spring was was released as a CD also, and it actually won a, a prize. I think it was the first CD, orchestra CD, and it won some kind of a international prize. Oh, and must have been so like early 80s, right? Yeah, it was it was recorded. Well, 81, that was yeah. the year it was recorded. And I know it was it was our first release as a CD. Now, a lot of that, a lot of these have been re-released. Oh, yeah, CDs of course. They're so probably available on streaming services as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And then, you know, the, the, the Yarby recordings are... I mean, there, there are a lot of, of interesting pieces that you wouldn't hear. A lot of obscure pieces that, you know, we, we will be listening to our TV sometimes on one of the music channels, and all of a sudden we'll say Detroit Symphony, and we'll play a Bristol piece or, a, you know, something, you know. So you, so you didn't go back, with Yarby, you didn't go back and record as much of the core repertoire? No. Because you had just recorded it. Yarby didn't like to record core repertoire. He liked to record... We did a lot of American music. We mm -hmm. did a lot of, uh, I mean, we were recording lots of Barber. We were recording um, just a lot of, ups oh, a lot of, of African American music. Mm -hmm. I think we did a lot of, we did two or three still symphonies, I think, and things like that. But he liked to record really obscure pieces. That that was his favorite thing to do, especially pieces that nobody else had recorded. Wow. But he was, I, I love Naomi Harvey, I mean, he's still around. And, I'll, I'll have to dig into some of those recordings. He was, uh, you know, he would show up and he said, oh, it's so wonderful to be back to make beautiful music with you. And I mean, he was just a big, warm guy. He wanted to give him a big hug. So. Well, for, for the magazine, I'm reviewing a CD player this summer, so I'm definitely yeah. going to have to hunt down some of those CDs and, and use them <laughs> in the review. Well, um, thank you so much, Bob, for sharing your time and your talent with us. I think this will be a, a real treat for the viewers. Well, it's a treat for you, and it's also a treat playing with you, Michael. He's uh, playing Principal Lobo this week in the Tucson Symphony. Oh. I'm playing second this soon, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been great to play with you. It's been great to have you here. So thank yeah. you very much, and I'll yeah. see you all next time. All right, good. Thank you. So. And um, so for... Hold on. <laughs> I'll start that again. That's okay. <laughs>